Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am delighted to launch this new series on the design way by uh, Harold Nelson. And I'm sorry, I always forget the name of your co-author, but um, I, I am just, uh, you know, just, just tickle print to, to do this. Um, what has happened is that, uh, I, let me tell you the story of this, of how this came to be. I was interviewing my friend CJ. Now CJ has been running the Thinking Society in greater, you know, the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society for the past 10 years. And he's been doing meetups on the design way for the past seven years. He's done about 25 meetups. I'm going to have my friend Joe list all the meetups that he has done so far. He, he has done about two or three meetups with us on design way, and he has planned four more for the rest of the year. He's working, CJ is working on a book called Collaborating for Comprehensivism. And his base is Buckminster Fuller, but he regards the work, this particular book, Design Way, as critical. I interviewed him about his book and he held up this book four times. I said, how come, why is it that this person whom I thought was steeped in Buckminster Fuller is holding up this other book. Who is this person who has written this book? So I, I watched a 30 minute video by Harold Nelson. And I said, okay, I have to read this. So I have rigged my um, Kindle up so it can speak to me. So I just, I just inhaled the book. Okay, I, have to, I just inhaled the whole book in the last four days. Um, then I went to Philadelphia to talk to folks who had actually done several meetups on the book. But the way in which CJ works is that he takes individual concepts, individual parts of the book, and spends a lot of time fully explicating them. So many, many people have know the value of this, of why you should go into it. But my approach is slightly different. I always like to look at things as a whole. So we are going to this is the most challenging project. Uh, and so we are going to, it's really going to stress, stretch our format of 52 living ideas. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. Now, what I have done is I have tried to present, I'm going to, we're going to start with actually multiple short presentations to introduce the topic. Originally, the idea was to get people excited about reading this book so that we could start going through it chapter by chapter. We have done this very effectively with something actually much more difficult, and that is Tao De Jing. Tao De Jing is far more difficult because it is written in 500 BC in China. The script is very different. The way in which the script operates in the mind is very different. It is a metaphorical work that points in, that kind of suggests things instead of naming things as we do in English language. So it's very difficult to get the cultural base and to grasp it. And about 50 of us are going through it chapter by chapter. We take a verse, which is about 16 lines and spend two hours talking about it. Everybody reads their favorite translations. Several of us are making our own translations, including about half a dozen people who are half a dozen to dozen people who are of Chinese origin, who grew up with this, who are going through and interacting with people who are just coming into the book and getting new insights that they did not think possible. So what is happening with Dao De Jing at this meetups uh, on Tuesdays is truly magical. And I want to do the same thing. I wanted to choose something in the Western corpus that does that. Now, it is very challenging because the Western corpus is very large. Actually, the Chinese corpus and the Indian corpus is also very large, but we are not familiar with it. So we don't get, we do only look at the highlights. But Western corpus is very, very large. And I was, I've, we have been always working on how do East and West interact with one another. One of the crucial ideas that we came up with was simple observation that West is focused on transforming the world. It is all about designing the world. So this idea of design goes to the heart of human beings as such. I, mean, I think I, I call this meetup, uh, you are a designing animal. I think man as a designing animal is a better definition than a rational animal because it 
includes rationality, but includes the fact that you are, we live by transforming our environment. So it is, a, it goes to the heart of who we are as human beings and who we are as part of the West. I also was pleasantly surprised of how many different themes that we have talked about in these meetups have been covered by this book. They have been covered in passing as a support because the book you know, plows its way towards its goal. But those connections are very big, the connections with Tao Te Ching, with work of Carl Jung, uh, order and chaos and the hero's journey that you find. So we have, we have actually, we have a lot of vocabulary already ready to deal with this book. Now, one of the things that we do with 50, in 52 Living Ideas is that we are a community of learners and we have reverence for anybody who's trying to learn, regardless of their level of knowledge, the context that they're coming from. I want to make this accessible to everybody. This book was written, I think, largely towards like a designer audience and a little bit of the academic audience, but I want to make it accessible to everybody. So that's what I'm, you know, I'm inviting you to participate actively to show how you're using these ideas. How do you understand these ideas? And by trying to put together these multiple perspectives, we will learn about this book together. So what I'm going to do is that I have four slides that I'm going to present, uh, you know, three summarizing the book and fourth talking about our method of dealing with not just this book. This is our method in these 52 living ideas. There are many people here today who are new, maybe about 10 to 12, 12 people who are new. So I want to make sure that they are all on board in what we are doing. We've been doing, I've been doing this for about five years. We've done more than 600 Zoom meetups and probably another 200 in-person meetups. Those in-person meetups used to be five to eight hours. Zoom meetups are very short, only two hours each. About 25,000 people have come through it over the last, uh, you know, uh, over, you know, since COVID. So we've tested this format out. Uh, I call it oral hermeneutics. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to try to summarize, um, summarize the book in my own way. It's, it's a very simple diagram to hold the core theme of the book uh, that I find useful. I don't know if you find it useful. Um, that's good. Then I'm going to have my friend Joe talk about just list all the work that we have done in the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Thanks to CJ. So we, we're going to look at you know all the all the meetups that he has done very briefly. That's going to be just running through the list of the meetups. Then Jean, who is an architect, uh, who when I talked to her about joining us, she said. I do this all the times. So I am not familiar with the book. Design is what I do. And people really do not understand what design is. It's a very simple concept, but almost nobody understands it. So she's going to give us her summary of the video. Um, then we're going to go back to Joe. And Joe has three points that he got from the video. He's going to list through those. All of these are going to be like five minute presentations. I'm the one who is talking a lot in order to set the context for everybody. Uh, then we are going to go to Charlie, uh, who is an amazing guy. I was, I, I never try to tell Charlie, you know, what topic he should talk on because whatever he talks about you on usually surprises me uh, in on the upside. So he, he always generates something. So he's going to talk about how he sees this idea of design applied to journalism. Then Rupali, who has been studying. Louis Sullivan for the past 20 years. And she's one of the panelists who, um, whom I work with, along with uh, other, uh, other panelists. She's also an architect and an educator. She's going to talk about the idea of design presented in the video as compared to Louis Sullivan's ideas that we have all been working on of form follows function. Then Marissa, is going to talk about the six ideas, six key ideas. She, Marisa is from Philadelphia and she has attended many of CJ's meetups. And she's going to list six ideas that she has found 
six ideas from the book that she has found useful in grasping it. So that, so this, this is kind of a way of just putting the book on the table for you. And then I'm going to invite anybody who has read the book to ask, to answer two questions. What did you get from the book? And why do you think everybody should be reading this book? Or why would you recommend this book? Okay, so I'm inviting everybody to do that. Once we have done that, we are going to go into breakout rooms, small groups of about eight people each. These are going to be facilitated that is going to focus on discussing these ideas. And you are going to come back with the best question you have about the book, okay, or any of the concepts that are presented. And then we are going to organize, I'm going to organize all those questions, like a map of questions, a hierarchy of questions. So see what is on people's mind. And then we are going to try to answer that everybody gets a chance to answer them in a lightning fashion. Answers are not important, it's the questions that are important at this stage and probably always, um, but that's, that's what you're going to do. So that's the format. Now let me go ahead and start um, the presentation here. Just going to run through this. Let me see here, there, uh, present. All right. The design way. This is my like a 50,000 feet view of design way after just going through it very quickly. I'm just trying to see a general pattern. The biggest thing that remains in my mind is that there is real. There are things that are real. Reality is what it is. Nature is what it is. Your experience is what it is. That's the left-hand side. That's the red arrow. Then we process it to figure out what is true. That is epistemology. The first one is metaphysics. The second one is epistemology. The first one deals with what is. The second one deals with how do we know it? Just check that it is true. How do you integrate it with everything else? So that is cultural products. This is your rational faculty. Both these are used to project an ideal where we need to go. We are living beings. Jacob Bronowski says we are living beings who are able to project the future and plan for the future. Design is taking in reality, processing it with our rational faculty, our, all our faculties, projecting an ideal and actually building something in reality to make that ideal happen and doing this again and again. So I think regarding human beings as designing animals is a fundamental way of looking at human beings. I think that's the best definition that I have found of human beings. Now, this seems very simple. It's the crucial part of it is that it's an and. So the yellow line, which is design, you can see the two black um, perpendiculars from there. It depends on real and it depends on your rationally processing everything. So it is union of both these things. It is not either or, but it is an and. Um, now, this seems like when I presented it to a whole bunch of people in Philadelphia, because they were used to this idea, they said, oh, this looks very simple. But then why is it that most people have trouble with it? And I think this is why people have trouble with it. What happens is that many people are focused on reality, and in trying to hold on to focus, hold on to the focus on reality experience, they actually push back at the current culture ideas, given ideas. So that's like, that's a subjectivist approach. A traditional culture holds on to the culture and is pushing back at new things, new individual initiatives, new ideas that are coming in when at the edge of the consciousness, you are noticing that something is wrong, you're pushing it back. I will, I will call it dogmatist or traditionalist approach. 
And most people, when they think about this issue, they think about it in terms of subjectivist versus dogmatic. And they go back and forth in the horizontal axis, basically thinking of it as either or. Design actually unites these things. Design says and. Now there is the fourth alternative, which is nihilist, which says no to both of them. So another way of looking at it is you can look at it in terms of hands. You know, you have your left hand. I don't know whether this is getting transposed in Zoom, but you have your left hand, which is the um, which is reality, and here you have. So reality is reality, nature. Here you have got your rational faculty, your thinking, your culture. And what you're doing with design is that you're bringing both of these together. You're always working with both of them, integrating both of them to project towards a move towards a better world, using your imagination, using moving towards the idea. That's what you're doing. What a traditionalist does is that it focuses only on the culture and it goes like this against the new input that is coming in from reality. What a subjectivist does is that it they love the current experience and they go against all the established ideas or culture. And of course, nihilist goes like this. So design is like this. So that's the simplest way of putting it. Now, we have seen versions of this across many different areas. So it's real on the left and true on the other. Yin versus yang, subconscious and conscious. This is um, yin and yang is Lao Tzu, um, subconscious and conscious. We've studied Jung in great amount of detail. Chaos and order, we have looked at Joseph Campbell, jo Jordan Peterson talking about this analog and digital, um, or oral and written. Walter Ong has talked about this. Individual and community, that's another way of looking at it, concrete and abstract, intuitive and rational, potential and actual, function and form, nature and culture, metaphysics and epistemology, future and past, right brain, left brain, challenge and skill, these are some of the ways of looking at it. And it's a question of integrating these things. Um, so I think that is, that is I see it as core of the issue um, on about the idea of design. Now, what we are going to do is something, I want to talk a little bit about our method of doing this. Um, now, all of us, like most of us are used to this. This is what we do day in and day out. This is the 52 living ideas method. I, the best name for it is oral hermeneutics, you know, thanks to Walter Ong. What we're trying to do is that we're trying to integrate multiple perspectives. We start from something written. In this case, it's this book. It's going to be chapter by chapter. Then we have an oral conversation about it. We get in multiple perspectives. Each person brings their own context to bear on what is written. And then ultimately we are going to produce a list of questions. And then we are going to go off on our own and we are going to go ahead and apply these ideas on our own. The format of the discussion is that we start with takeaways. We'll ask the question, what did you get from this chapter? Each person will summarize what they got from the chapter. Then we are going to go into breakout rooms so we can talk much more in a free flowing way about these ideas. When you come back, you come back with the best question that you can possibly come up with. By the way, one of the standard things that we use in our meetups is this, which I consider the greatest invention, the greatest technology, and that's pen and paper, because we are going to be covering a lot and everybody is going to be talking about it from multiple angles. There is no way of being present for what is coming in if you try to hold it in your mind at the same time. So you need to put it down and you need to continuously organize what you are getting from it. Believe me, in these meetups, 
more happens than what happens when you read the book because you're hearing many perspectives and you are trying to put together other people's perspectives, relating your perspective to other people's perspective. That's where most of the action is, okay? So then in the breakout rooms, you come back from the breakout rooms with all the questions. What I do is that I try to formulate the questions in a simpler way and I try to organize them in some kind of a hierarchy, mostly from general to specific, and then we put the question on the table and everybody who wants to answer it, answers it in brief. So that way we get one more level. And those questions that we come up with, we publish it on Meetup and on the YouTube video. So that will act as a reference for everybody who wants to process it further through the audio in conjunction with written, okay? I want to remind everybody, this is not your TV. Okay, this is not for passive observing. You don't get anything from passive observing. This is not entertainment. This is an active process, proactive process. The entire format is designed for you to be able to speak. Okay, so please act, please interact. That is what generates the value to you and to others. Those people who put in more effort are more proactive will actually get more. Currently, today, few people are presenting as panelists, but you could be them, okay? There is really no distinction. I'm just, from next time onwards, I'm going to simply ask the question, what did you get from this chapter? If you have read the chapter, then please volunteer and put your thoughts on the table. Regardless of whether you've been focused on this book for the past 20 years and applying it every day in your profession, or you have just started, there is magnificence in each of us. If you are trying to honestly understand something, whether you realize it or not, you have a lot to offer to other people. We want to hear your perspective. That is how we are going to take whatever is written to a new level of understanding because that's the only way for us to grasp it. But learning together is what we do here. Another unique thing that we do at this meetup is called syntopical thinking. This is based on Mortimer Adler's idea in how to read a book. We will continuously try to connect ideas here with all the other ideas we've been studying. Harold Nelson's vision is to create a culture of design or a design culture. We need to integrate culture with design. And that's what we are particularly at this meetup, that's what we are good at doing. That's what we do again and again. So I want to connect ideas in this book with all the other ideas in all the other fields that we have been studying. This is the core of the comprehensivist program that CJ is working on and that we are working on, okay? So it is going to actually help us in everything else that we do. Last, we have four rules that we have used for past five years. Type an exclamation mark, and these are all design. We're talking about you know, individual and community, okay? These meetups are designed to make it possible for individuals to express themselves as fully as possible while contributing a tremendous value to the community. To do that, we have some very simple formatting and very simple rules. The rules are type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom to speak. Keep on topic because that's what we are here to do. If it is too dispersed, it's difficult for people to put together multiple perspectives. To put together multiple perspectives, it should be a, they should be all focused on a small point, which is going to be a chapter. Be brief. There's a lot of people on this call who have amazing things to say. You want to hear them and be courteous. Feel free to speak your mind. Disagree with anybody on anything, but do so courteously. All right, so that's very quick. Uh, that, that's an overview. Uh, sorry, it went off, went on a little bit longer than I had hoped, but 
Uh, now it's going to be, uh, we're going to start with uh, Joe. And Joe, um, if you could tell us, uh, I mean, I, you know, I am really, I, I am always in awe of CJ and how much he manages to do. But the entire series of meetups that uh, CJ has done, and the way in which CJ does meetups is that he does a very detailed write-up on each of the ideas, and then he runs the meetup. So, um, Joe, if you could uh, talk a little bit about your experience attending CJ's meetups on the design way, and then just list the meetups that he has done. Sure, it. absolutely. I mean, so CJ has been doing meetups on the design way since uh, 2015. And what he's done is he's been actually integrating a lot of other concepts and other designers like Buckminster Fuller into some of the uh, meetups that he's been holding uh, on the design way. Uh, and I can honestly say they're probably the most uh, vigorously debated and um, and most uh, uh, well attended um, meetups that we have. Uh, it's been a really successful series. Uh, I've learned a lot from it personally. Uh, it's taught me to look at the world differently uh, from a number of different perspectives, uh, just in things with like onto uh, with ontologies and frameworks. Uh, you know, it gave me new perspectives that again, that I try to even incorporate where I work. So it's really been a transformative experience for me, but also others. And some of the people that we do attend our meetups are very experienced uh, designers. So, uh, you know, we, it's been really a fantastic ride. Uh, and so I'm just gonna go through uh, some of the, the meetups that we have held over the past five, uh, six years, uh, give you a little bit of an idea of how we've been approaching the design way up to this point. And then we'll come back and we'll discuss, uh, we can discuss in greater detail. I think for those of you who have already read the book, you're gonna be very familiar with a lot of these titles and concepts uh, that I'll be talking about. So the first meetup that we did was uh, the design way was humanity's first tradition of inquiry and action. Uh, and here we just really focused on the fundamentals, uh, the foundations of design and how we connect the concrete to our value systems. Uh, and that was our first meetup and that was back in 2015. Now, the second one, are we lame gods in service of a prosthetic gods? Uh, that basically focused on the idea of reconstituting Sophia and wisdom uh, and getting the purpose of our design down, understanding why we're doing this design work. More importantly, CJ, really, I remember in this particular meetup, hammered how design needs to be for service of others. And that's an important perspective for us to have. The third one is the imperative ongoing genesis, ontology and responsibility. Uh, here again, uh, as I mentioned already, we explored the nature of reality, ontological thinking, how ontolo ontologies and frameworks, uh, we use them in our decision-making. And we really covered what were the practical and ethical implications in our intentions in that particular meeting as well. Uh, number four was the aspiring to remake our worlds together. Now, this is how, again, we're applying our abilities and our uh, to help meet the needs of others. And specifically, we focused, we incorporated some Buckminster Fuller into this particular meetup where the question was, how can I be of service without diminishing your degrees of freedom? And we really kind of focused on both balancing freedom and as well as being of service to others. Uh, number five was the roles of the real, the true, the ideal and in inquiry uh, for action. Um, again, this comes back to some of the key concepts in the books. The real is the concrete and the reality. The true is which could be and what needs to be when we're thinking about design. And the ideal, represents our most ambitious values. And that's something that's really kind of critical in throughout the entire Design Way book. Uh, another fantastic meetup was uh, systems thinking, a way of inquiry and action. Uh, how we use integrated, how integrated systems impact the design process. 
um, how systems thinking impacts how we observe the world and um, how it changes our perspective and limits our imagination in certain, in certain circumstances. Uh, the seventh meetup on it was the, the whole and the particular in inquiry for action. Um, this was just basically the distinction between the particular and the whole. Uh, this, was in this was enlightening to me because it really, uh, I used it in different frameworks to understand the particular as a process and how principles fit into that process actually. Um, and how I can think about the whole with, pr with principles and particulars as a process. Um, the necessities and impossibilities of being a comprehensivist. We, this was a co-meetup with Buckminster Fuller and the design way. Uh, so being a comprehensivist, one of the things that we uh, kind of focused on here and at 52 Living Ideas in general is not you know, being a specialist, getting caught up and being detached from the things that we're actually designing which is something that is critical for the design way. And by being a comprehensivist, you're kind of looking at the whole and taking a different approach to uh, design altogether. And that kind of fits in nicely with the design ways uh, um, uh, theme. So number nine was ways of inquiry and knowing, uh, assessing humanity's great traditions. Uh, this was actually looking at the cultural aspects of things, and we've really kind of embraced that here. We've looked at different cultures, how they, they look at design, why they design things, the idea of design, is the, how science, spirituality, art, the humanities, technology, mathematics, theology, philosophy, morality, and aesthetics all fit in to the idea of design. Uh, that was a that was a very long meetup, actually. I, I, I kind of recall, recall that. Um, so the uh, number 10 was the problem with problem solving. And I'll try and go a little bit quickly, a quick more, uh, little faster here because I know I'm taking up a lot of time. Is there a solution? Um, and basically how we're, this, this particular uh, meetup, if I remember correctly, uh, was what is the problem that we're solving? And how does the design actually fit into solving that particular problem? Are we just solving a problem or is there something else that we're missing in the process? Uh, the, the role of desire and intention in the genesis of that which is not yet. Um, again, this actually really focused on change. Uh, how our desires are important to triggering and initiating change. Uh, how it energizes how it, it, it basically uh, it helps create effective change um, and how it is, uh, it's, uh, it relates to our intentional, it relates to intentional change. Uh, number 12 is assessing reality to make change, interpretation and measurement. Uh, just basically some of the fundamental tools that we use when we're measuring change. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep that one pretty brief uh, because there, the following one was the measurements of life, a foundation for making effective change. And what are the standards that we were using for life to measure quality of life and the spirit of life when we're looking at change? Uh, number 14 is imagination, creativity, and other formative faculties of the mind and uh, what is the distinction? We went over the distinctions between imagination and creativity um, uh, in that particular meetup. And then uh, dialogue, creating meaning through words. Uh, basically, exactly just that. We're, you know, how do we create things? How do we create meaning through words? Which is actually one of the, uh, print, one of the interesting parts of the, uh, of the video where the designing mind was spoken about. Uh, and hopefully we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, invoking the not yet existing to create effective intentional change in the world. Um, this was identifying the conceptual tools and processes in order to create new things. And the last one I'll talk about is the logic of human judgment. 
exploring the means for wise action. Um, how do we make good judgments? Uh, is, why, is wise inquiry a prerequisite to wise action? Um, and that's pretty much the most important part of the book, in my opinion. So those are just some of the meetups. There's actually about seven or eight more that we could have uh, named, but that gives you a good idea as to. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So, um, you know, thanks to CJ, there is a lot of written material because what CJ does is that he's a very, very meticulous thinker. So he has written detailed essays on each of these topics, and these will be resources for us. That's one. Second, there are at least about 20 people here from the Philadelphia Society who have actually attended all of these, many of these meetups. So all of that conversation has been percolating. All these ideas have been percolating in their minds for years, and we are going to get the benefit of all of that. We're going to use these as resource material as we go along. We are going to go chapter by chapter, but we are going to bring in everything that is done. In addition to these, there are videos that uh, CJ has done jointly with us, and he's planning more videos. So there are already, I think, about two to three, three videos on this, and four more are coming. Uh, and that's going to be a separate series. So in addition, to this, all right, and this is, uh, you know, thanks to CJ, we have amazing, Joe, do, you did a fantastic job of, of quickly summarizing uh, all of these. So, uh, so folks, what I'm going to do is that now uh, it's going to be uh, Gene, who's going to summarize, we, we, we put a video, a 30 minute video by uh, Harold uh, on the meetup page to give you an idea of what is being done, you know, what is, what is this book about? And what Jean is going to do is that she's going to summarize the, that video for us. You know, Jean is an architect and she's, you know, she, she lives design. So that's what uh, Jean is going to do. And then we're going to go to Charlie for a quick observation about application of these ideas to journalism, then to Rupali, and then to Maritza. And I invite everybody who has read the book to go ahead and type exclamation mark to share your take on the book. Uh, you know, you can talk for anywhere between two to four minutes on what you got from the book. All right. So let's go to Jean next. Jean, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm very glad to have this opportunity. So I'm architect in Seattle. And I always think it's such a great idea to share the concept of design with everybody else. I think we have AIA, but we are just overly educated all the designers. <laughs> but I have clients I found they have no idea about the designs. I think it's, a, so I'm very glad, you know, we have the honor to learn about this with Howard Nelson together. And I just want to quickly summarize what I learned from the lecture. So the first word, uh, I think he talked about what is design. Discovery versus design. I actually shared this with one of my doctor in Italy and he really referred to the fire is not discovery, it's design. So he's very excited about the concept too. Um, the difference between observation and the imagination. I think the scientific approach, we emphasize too much about observing and discovery instead not emphasizing imagination, which is the key. Even uh, I think Einstein mentioned, the key of the, it's not the thinking, it's imagination. And, and the, uh, he also mentioned uh, Da Vinci, you know, he's, is he a scientist or artist? No, he's designer because he purpose driven integrated approach to life, to the world. And the designer basically is a prime, uh, prime creator of our experience reality, reality. All the things around us, especially mentioned in the end, most of the things around us now is design. It's not nature anymore. So design is a survey distinct from art and science. So since we learn so much with this five to living ideas, we talk about Eastern and Western philosophy, the difference between the one is the Eastern philosophy emphasizes more on the right brain versus the left uh, Western philosophy emphasizes Plato emphasizes 
a lot on the left brain about reasoning and the uh, and the eastern philosophy emphasize a lot about the feeling you know so i think design is integration of both uh, he also mentioned in the lecture about reconstruct Sophia, the integration of thought and action through design. And then we go back to the history of design. You know, uh, since snow, it's good for me to learn about this. It's, it's the first time I learned about this. How snow at his time, he separate the two subjects, the science from the art. That's, I think that's actually helped me understand the ori origin of our current problem is education. I have shared a lot of time with the people here. I have a challenge with my kids who really get bored at school because they're really learning different subjects, not anything related to, re to reality. I think that's actually start from snow. <laughs> Someone to blame for that. The whole education system and the design is actually the combination of science and art, the reasoning and the creativity part. And then we go back to the original design, you know, the archetype type of designer. So, and um, the purpose of design is add to the real world. So it makes me wonder what is real world? So is virtual reality a real world? Because I see right now we are, we have a lot of design that no longer because we, I was very proud to be architect before, but then now we have less and I'd like we have the Zoom meeting here. It seems we have less and less emphasis on the physical world, more and more on the virtual world, like virtual reality. You know, everybody uh, watched Matrix before, you know, people, is that the future for us? Just hook on the wires to get all the feelings instead of then the architect, that's the reason architect lost the position in the current society instead of the computer engineering. So my, I actually think the possibility, because as human being, we learned the important thing for us, not just our brain, but also our physical being, how we interact with nature and the world around us. I think that's actually make us question how the virtual world and physical world, how we can reintegrate them through the design. So the design is a great service to humanity and also could be great harm. I think that's come back to one is the intention, the other is our understanding of a bigger picture. As we learn through Dao De Jing, you know, follow the Dao. I think the Western culture emphasize way too much about conquer nature. So we ignore how nature works in a bigger picture. So we just can't create whatever feed our needs. We create all this plastic. Now we don't know how to deal with it. We create this uh, nuclear power waste. We don't know what to do with it. So we have keep creating things without understanding the holistic picture. I think that's, as a designer, it's very important to understand that. Then they go back to the architectural designer from the Greek. And it's interesting to learn the story how his imperfection actually helped him to become a designer because the, he need to create things to make it better experience for him. Then in the end, they help others as well. Then others help ask him for his service to provide design for them too. And um, why we do the design? Is that for survival? And more than that is to improve and development, to make a difference in the world. Actually, that's maybe the reason I'm, I become an architect because I think we all want to make the world better. We have the free will. We want to, through creation, make the order in, world, world into order. It's remind me about the, through Joseph Peterson, we learned about order and chaos. The nature most likely is chaos. And through the man-made, we made these odors. And um, also about the hero's quest, how we through this, we learned so much about theology through Joseph Peterson, about the people through the hero's quest to conquer, conquer their fear and become, you know, make a better world around them. So I think it's also relate, related to how we want to control the environment, you know, it's part of that. And also the lack of wholeness, the world condition is not satisfied. That's why we want to make improvement. improvement. It reminds me of our uh, designers all idealistic. So we know 
every few generation of designer, there's people who create this utopian world. You know, we try to, even now, you know, we're thinking the urban, there's the city is too big. People are not, don't have small community. We disassociate with food, all these things. And I actually really wish we have more architect, designers, and the, the people work together to create more ideal world for everybody. And as means of enlightenment to bring order and give meaning to our life. That's what designer trying to be. And then we go back to how as Sophia at the how it was breaked from the wisdom and love, how how was originally the doing and thinking was together. Then as Aristotle time, they actually separate the first principle and the cause and the practical wisdom and productive activities. So the thinking and doing used to be, to be the circular process. That's how we learn. We think, then we do things. When they think a bit, again, and do it better. That's a great way to get this, how we learn things. Unfortunately, at that time, they separated and make into a hierarchy. So people who think become the top of society and who people who make things become bottom of society that even come today, we have white collar, blue collar management labors, you know, it seems they pay, they play higher role of the thinking and lower role of the making. And then that's, I think, create all these social problems because like the politician, they're the thinker, they don't even understand what's happening in the world. And they, they create, I think, design actually is the middle point to combine the thinking and doing. So I think, what uh, Howard Nielsen mentioned about design, the third culture, I see is as a possibility to solve so many problems in our society nowadays, the global warming, nature of mankind, and the political polarization. Because I think design is a circular process, the combination of the left and right brain, the integration of thinking and doing. I think once we all learn this, we may be able to solve these problems and start with the right intention and design process. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean. That, that was fantastic, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Charlie, uh, Rupali and Maritza. Uh, folks, uh, if you would like to share what you got from the book, go ahead and type a uh, exclamation mark uh, and we'll go from there, Charlie. Uh, yeah, uh, for me, uh, I see uh, this being very important for people who are considering the issue of redesigning uh, social institutions like uh, economics and finance and the expression of power. How is that acceptable? It is considered to be acceptable expressions of power. Uh, the justice system, how, how, how does that work? How do, how do people resolve conflicts? It's, all of these are social institutions that have developed over time, but with a design concept that was not particularly well um, thought out. Uh, but the one I kind of have the personality of a, um, of a journalist. And so uh, right now we're in the middle of a, uh, of a um, collapse of the whole structure of how news is uh, is 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 uh, shared throughout the community or throughout the country or throughout the world, and uh, and and so um, uh, I think that this is something that another institution you know, it started off with a town crier would go around through a town and and, and you know because people didn't know how to read or write and so there had to be someone who who could um, you know go through the markets and and and, and so on and and cry out you know what was the important news of the day. And uh, so uh, this uh, institution of, of communication of important ideas, okay, uh, is, um, I, it, it, well, it's collapsing right now, okay? The newspapers are going out of business and the, and, and the uh, television stuff is, 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 is degenerating into infotainment and so on. And so it's, it, I see that there's a real need for um, rethinking of how, how that is going to be done. And, and so I'm really enthused about this book because I, I think that, because that, I've, I've tried to think about this uh, many times and, uh, and, and it comes away as like, as some people say, a wicked problem. And, uh, and it is hyper wicked because it is really complicated. And, uh, but, um, but I, I'm hoping to, uh, to learn from this book so that maybe I can make it so it isn't so hopelessly wicked. 
Oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie, I'm, I'm delighted that you are putting your mind to this and uh, I am really looking forward to uh, seeing what, what, you, what you get from it. So thank you. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Rupali talking about connecting these ideas with ideas of Louis Sullivan that we've been studying for many, many decades. I, I uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Louis Sullivan. Um, I've been, uh, I, I, when I read Kindergarten Chats, I bought 32 copies and gave it to everybody whom I could think of. And I was astonished to find that, of course, one, foot, one third of the people had the right reaction. This changed my life. This is amazing. But one third of the people to ask me, what is this? What is he saying? Why did you give me this? So I had to go and rewrite or re-edit and do the whole book. It took me a year to do so. I'm a very, very big fan. And Rupali, my friend uh, from like 23 years or 24 years, something like that. She's an architect and she's a big fan of Louis Sullivan too. So, and we've done a whole series. I think we've done almost like 40 meetups on Louis Sullivan, uh, his ideas. So I would like to connect up uh, these two things. And I think Rupali can do it better than me. So Rupali. Well, I uh, want to thank you for your, for the copy that you gave me. I'm one of those 32 people who received a copy of Kindergarten Chats from you. I want to begin with Louis Sullivan's proposition, form follows function. And when he says form follows function, what does he mean by form? And in this book, Kindergarten Chats, Louis Sullivan talks about form being expression an expression of human thought. So do forms just exist in uh, man-made objects or do forms exist in nature? And so Louis Sullivan in this book, uh, Kindergarten Chats, implores us to kind of go and look at nature. And he says, look at nature, every flower, every tree, every vine is different. There's no single formula for the formation of details. The details are a part of the whole. They are the same germ of idea in all, that's all of its manifestations. So Louis Sullivan asks us to look at flowers, leaves, trees, and the details within each of these natural structures. So this question can then be answered that if we draw inspiration from nature, then differentiation is necessary. The details must seem must not seem detached from the mass. Instead, they must all be a part of the whole, that you know that the mass holds all of its detail in its finest points. So he talks about um, for the whole form being a, a whole and all of them, all of the parts having the same DNA in them. So now, um, how do we look at nature and create, right? So he believes in, human being, the man, as the creator. And when he says man, it's applied to men and women. And so he says, you know, how do humans um, express their designs? Uh, one of the things that uh, I was, um, you know, intrigued by was not the separation of uh, science, technology, and the humanities, that when you look at them together, and Louis Sullivan does the same thing, he says, well, Human beings are creators. They first use their hands to create. Um, so I'm just going to go to the section about that. He says, the work of hand, so the hand is the instrument of human, um, human thought and man's intelligence. He says, man infused his bare work with the quality of his emotions and thus found in them companionship he yearned for because they were of himself. His growing intellect must have gone on satisfying his physical needs and amplifying their expression. Instinct alone in inspiring the work of his hand and intellect could satisfy the craving of his heart, the hunger of his soul. Thus, man unconsciously began to create in his own image. So the fact that we have the desire to create, to change something within our environment to make it for what we want, what it should be, not what it is as is. So I think that is something that um, Louis Sullivan talks about, which I feel is similar to what we are talking about in the design way. Um, 
So what are the powers of man? Um, one of the things that Louis Sullivan talks about is the creative spirit in every one of us. Every single human being is born with that creative spirit. And um, we have the will to create and change the environment or create the environment that we live in. So now that we are in a time and space where uh, we are changing the world, one of the things that I got from the 30 minute video is how the, the pace at which we are impacting change in the world. And um, if it is our will to create, then what should that look like? Um, so one of the things that um, Louis Sullivan talks about is, you know, what should our uh, education be like to, to create people to be able to think in this manner? And he says, if our civilization is showing signs of internal disintegration, the corrective can be found only in the counter power of change of vision, change of choice, of the establishment of sound proper education, an education which shall inculcate as its basic element, that simple wholesome moral sense that makes for true citizenship and a resultant sound noble fabric of individual, communal and national democracy. And I think within that sentence, he talks a lot about um, having the moral compass. So we're not just talking about the technical elements. We're not just talking about the science uh, behind design, but we are also talking about what do we want as human beings for the world that we live in. Um, so then he goes on in his book to talk about um, how, how, do, how do we create art? So in his essay about um, the tall building considered, he talks about our five senses with which we perceive our world. But beyond the five senses, we also have our imagination, which is key to design. Uh, Jean talked about imagination in her presentation. And he says, imagination is the beginning of action because it's the sympathy that lives both in our senses and our intellect. The next is inspiration. So everything without, you know, to, to be inspired to do something um, is absolutely necessary, certainly to the mastermind, a task, surely, but not a done. And then he says, then comes thought. So thinking, imagination, they go hand in hand um, from, from thought to expression. So the thought, the human brain is able to discern what, um, what is, what, what the doubts are, what are the inquiries, it recognizes time and space, material limitations. So whether it's economic, whether it's social, psychological, all of those impacts that design has on the human life. Uh, and then finally, design, the expression, open-armed and free, supple, active, dramatic, changeable, beautifully pensive, persuasive, and wonderful. Thus art comes to life, thus life becomes art. And that's Louis Sullivan's um, approach in a nutshell. Wonderful, beautifully put. Thank you, thank you, Rupali. Um, I the most kind of direct equivalence I see in you know form follows function and um, in design way is the concept of ensouled design. It's a design which is kind of functionated, which has kind of function in it. Uh, so that's. Um, and I think I, I, I see them as basically talking about same things in different languages. Um, Louis Sullivan is writing about 100 years ago. He's far more poetic in his presentation. Uh, Harold is writing 100 years after that, and he is using prose. And he's actually being very systematic in describing things instead of being poetic. So it's the different forms of presentation, but they're trying to, I think they're trying to get at the same thing. Um, all right, so now we're going to go to uh, Maritza. What Maritza has done is uh, she has attended many, many of CJ's um, meetups and she's picked six ideas from Design Way, which give you a sense of the approach of it because what happens is that 
you really have to empty your concept of design, of all, all kinds of preconceptions you had about design to kind of rethink about it. And in order to do that, there is a whole bunch of concepts that uh, Harold uses in order to make that point. So those are like the second level uh, concepts. Again, this is not a result of a very systematic work, but it gives you a more, the second level detail about what this concept of design is about and how uh, Harold approaches it. Remember, everything that we are saying right now is simply to get you to read the book, okay? You have to formulate all of this yourself. The whole thing is saying there is enough, there is so much in there that's going to be so useful to you. So you need to go out and get the book. Uh, Joe, if you could put the uh, book uh, URL in the, uh, you know, the Amazon URL in the uh, chat, I would appreciate that. Um, next up is Marisa. Marisa, so go ahead. Okay, so uh, Shukant is uh, far too charitable. I did not come up with these six concepts. They are actually the six fundamentals as identified in the book. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, I have been uh, kind of uh, through osmosis, learning about this book with uh, CJ for a few years now. And, but I only recently purchased the book. That was uh, Shrikant's fault. And I, I didn't decide to read the book in order. I actually started with the core concepts and um, felt a little guilty until then I started reading the prelude. And the prelude encourages you to read the book in whatever order you feel inclined. So the six, con the six fundamental concepts that are identified in the book are um, desiderata. I'm sure there's a more American way to say that. I apologize. Interpretation and measurement, imagination and communication, judgment, composing and connecting, and craft and material. I pulled out some uh, things straight from the book, kind of reworked a little bit in my words. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a much higher level of um, overview, and if um, she can't wants, I can post the um, post it in the um, comments later. So this uh, desiderata is desired things. Those things which we desire is what we're calling here in this book the fundamental concept of desiderata. It's the starting. These are the starting point for the design process. In these six concepts, we walk through seeing a couple ideas that they all share. Every last one of them talks about intentional change. So while these are the six core concepts, it became clear to me upon reading all of them that they sit on top of a few other core concepts that maybe can be viewed almost as axiomatic in reference to the book. And one of them is intentional change. Any change that we're talking about for the entirety of this book, where the approach is intentional. And another um, foundation upon which all six of these sit is the idea of blending. The idea that these may be parts and there's parts within parts within parts that are identified, but every last one of them is a piece of a whole. The goal always is to get to a, a whole and you have to start with seeing the whole, which incidentally, it's reading these core concepts actually helped me understand a concept that CJ introduced to us a few weeks ago when talking about the whole shebang. I found myself not quite getting the concept until I read these and understood how is it that one goes from starting looking at the whole to finding meaning by looking at the parts of said whole and through seeing the meaning ending up back at a whole. These six concepts is the way. So desiderata is your desired things, right? So depending on what we perceive as the basis for intentional action, there will be two different proportions and balance among the three. Aesthetics, ethics, and reason. That's a direct quote. And I felt that was really important to put out there. 
And then because right after that, it stated in real world contexts, everything is blended. And that's key. I feel that that sits underneath all these that sit on top of it. Interpretation and measurement is brought up to give to us first the very important idea that interpretation is a subjective process. Very important to understand that it's not actually objective. Honor is paid to all of the scientific ways for interpreting and measuring things. But it is stressed that they are not to be considered to be adequate in any design situation. Interpretation and, me and measurement are at the core of design activity, and yet they alone are not enough. That's the key takeaway here. It's we're being invited to stay focused on intention and desiderata while remaining open to the possibilities that reveal themselves in fortuitous ways, since meaning is never external to the inquirer and the scientific method and other interpretations and measurements of science are external. So that's why we know it's not enough because you cannot get the whole when you're only looking at one side. And then we're going to consider imagination and communication. So design is about bringing things into the world that have not existed before. And you know, we're gonna use imagination and communication along with some of these other core concepts to do so. There is homage paid to the fact that there are so many different ways to communicate things. The one design communication process that is presented above many others is the, I, it, the I'm, gonna, I'm sure I'm gonna kill this saying, it's a Greek word, Hello. Poetic design communication process. And it involves imagining and creating things intentionally outside of one's self with and on behalf of another's desires and purpose. Joe briefly touched upon the idea of service to others. This is where it's highlighted. There are the design communication process has iterative cycles of conversation. Dialogue and graphologue. And graphologue means to um, let a thing be seen through its image. So we're shown here that um, the formative powers in design for a designer perspective is that we need to both tightly hold imagination and creativity because one is almost worthless without the other. They have to be together. And yet we're again told that even together by themselves, they hold no value without the ability to communicate. It says good designs must be given form and communicated, which I think is just a beautiful concept and almost again, something that sits at underneath these six cores. Judgment, a lot of time is spent on judgment here. Um, and I, I think CJ's um, meetup on judgment is in the future yet for us here with the 52 um, living ideas. The, the most important thing to pull here when we're talking about judgment is that judgment is everywhere. We almost cannot do anything in our lives without some form of judgment. Judgment has these negative um, stereotypes, which is weird because we use it for everything. But in as presenting it as a core concept in the book here, we're shown that judgment is not founded on strict rules of reasoning. It is more likely to be dependent on the accumulation of the experience of consequences from choices made in complex situations. And it says, however, judgment is not irrational because it follows its own form of intuitive logic. And so this is, again, the process of taking in the whole in order to formulate a new whole. So the whole parts back into the whole. And judgment is essential to design. And I know I've probably said that for every one of these core concepts, but that's actually the overarching theme of the six concepts as presented to us here. 
We're looking at composing and connecting. And I love the phrase compositional assemblies. It actually comes up in some of the core concepts before we get to com com composing and connecting. So it's almost like an aha moment when it's defined to you here when we're looking at this core concept of composing and connecting. Um, here, we're again reminded, you know, you, you need the, the whole, and it says, um, to compose connections is to engage in design judgments and reason choices on an ongoing basis. Judgments about framing, composition, and connections are all creative acts. The level of creativity in a design is expressed in the way things are brought together and how they are related and connected in ways appropriate to the ultimate particular conditions and intentions. Compositional flow determines how the eye is led through a design, where it looks first, where it looks next, where the eye pauses and how long it stays. That last sentence is my paraphrasing of this entire section because that's what I am hearing when I'm seeing this concept of compositional assemblies. Craft and material kind of brings us to the concrete, right? We've been looking at core concepts. Now we're saying craft and material are necessary to bring a design concept into the real world. Well, naturally, right? You've been doing all this other stuff in your mind, using other people's mind together, separate. And so now craft is the skill set a designer needs to use when working with the right materials in the right proportion with the right tool set in order to produce a final desired designed outcome. And it says craft is where the hand and the mind come together in the process of bringing the not yet existing into the world. Because this is what we're doing here. Our creative process, this design culture is all for this purpose. Materials are what a designer brings together using structural connections or compositional arrangements. Ma materials are not passive. They speak back to the designer. I love that. When the materials speak back, it does so by showing the designer its limits and restrictions, as well as the possibilities. So uh, these are the six core concepts. I'm gonna stop there. I've probably taking way more time than I need to. Sorry, she can't. Thank you, guys. Oh, Marisa, that was that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you. So, folks, the whole purpose of laying these six concepts down, or actually everything that we have said right now, is to get you to read the book. Okay, because each of those six concepts, okay, it's a whole chapter, and CJ usually does a meetup on one fifth of a chapter. Okay, so it's very very deep and very, very complex. The whole purpose here is to give you an overview, quick overview, so you can um, orient yourself and get motivated to read the book with us. Okay, so the next, uh, so I'm going to now invite anybody, uh, let's try to keep the comments very brief because I want to go uh, to the breakout rooms. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, David. David, you've been attending CJ's meetups. What do you get from Design Way? Oh, sorry, just a second. I have to enable unmuting for everybody. David, go ahead. Sorry about that. Hi. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, right. CJ has inspired us for years with this book, and some of us find it very challenging book. And you read it in four days, and you know, it's just that's inspirational. Thank you for that. Now I know I have to completely read it. Uh, we've done, you know, you said chapters uh, in intense detail. There's a great deal of depth. You can bring anything into this. So it is a brilliant jumping off point for your series, I think. Um, and, and, and although I have a lot of problems with it as the way it's put together, I find it very difficult to read, you know, but that challenge plays out when you talk to people. So um, it looks as though they're giving a comprehensive description and that it should fall together. It hasn't fallen together for me yet, but it fits with many other things to me that are comprehensive. So it's a, a challenge. I would, I would say that um, it's a challenge to sort out their categorizations of things. I look at 
possibly this book as a commentary on other things that are complete systems or complete in what they cover. So I look at this as uh, saying, what is human life? Look at it as a design issue. See how many of these things apply. Look at, um, look at, look, what is it to live as a human being? A Heideggerian question. Um, it's to be engaged in a constant project, engaged in your future, being concerned with what you are and what your possibilities are at all times. So seeing that at many levels, because we have many projects at once, but our entire selves is this breadth that I think they're suggesting that there's design at the highest levels and that we're responsible for our lives in that way. Um, looking at the six things Maritza just spoke about as the systems that we employ, desiderata, we have to have values. Um, but in the large sense, these are not known yet. These haven't been made explicit. So it's a real challenge to me that how does this book help us find them? Because that's the great problem for bringing society in any direction is how come we're fractionalized and particular and separated? Why don't we realize, you know, Buckminster, we're on one little ball all working together on this spaceship. So uh, maybe that's the greatest question that comes out of it for me. An interpretation and measurement that's about our lives are filled with sense and perception, frames and concepts. And how do we do that? So it's a, a psychological thing in the world. And I think it makes sense to see a self in a world. And the designer is the self is going to be the actor on the world, which brings you into a new world. So you're constantly transforming yourself in that process. It's very good in this book to see that. But also you, a nice dimension in the book is that you're working conceptually in a group designing. So that's why communication becomes an important key. Expression is an important key. Ways of communicating. Um, and I'll just cut it off there. There's a lot more to say. Wonderful. Uh, David, I am delighted that you are reading the book. And I look forward to discussing this in great amount of detail because you always are wonderful. Wonderful. Reading Thank you. For, forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Brian, uh, you're next. Uh, uh, let's try to keep the comments short so we can go to our breakout room soon. Go ahead, Brian. So I agree very much with what uh, Charlie said. Uh, and there are also clear indications in this book uh, that the design way can be applied in many different contexts. And I'm eager to see how that works. Just to pick up on a sentence here in the uh, conclusion, does that the way it's written here, design competence allows individuals to become causal agents in the real world. Now I come from a business school background. And in fact, uh, I helped develop, uh, I was part of a network at the United Nations that developed sustainable curricula for business schools. So let me just say this, the, um, in that context, we're developing and proposing curricula to business schools. The, uh, but I mentioned that because we're already dealing with the causal agents in the real world. We're dealing with the business managers of the top corporations around the world. And I think the challenge from my perspective is to take these causal agents in the real world and turn them into designers. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Folks, now what we're going to do is that we're going to go into breakout rooms so we can discuss this for 20 minutes amongst ourselves. And then comes the main part, which is questions. What questions do you have about this book, about the concept of design? I want to gather all the questions, try to come up with the best question that you can, just one question per person. And then we will collect all of them and then we will try to answer them as best as we can. Remember, the questions are far more important than the answers. It might take us a long time to actually a great question takes a long time to answer it. So just get the let's get the great questions. I'm going to start the breakout rooms now. I'll see you back in 20 minutes. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. All right. So, folks, it's time for questions. 
the best questions that you have. Um, I want to get uh, as many questions. So go ahead and put your questions down. In order to um, do that, just go ahead and type exclamation mark in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. So it's going to be Jean, Rich, and Rojean. I'm, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to organize all the questions and then I'm going to go um, you know, ask them one by one and everybody gets to answer them. But first, let's get as you know, let's get all your questions. Jean, go ahead. Yeah, I share with our small group. You know, I see the separation between the uh, the design and making, the thinking and the maker. I think because of our specialization in our industrial revolution. And actually I saw, I visited recently visit a maker club for, with my kids at Seattle and I see the opportunity with new digital, new technology. Actually, everybody have the potential to make and design at the same time. I see this new revolution could come back. Ajin, you know, what's your question? So the question, do you think the new technology will support everybody have the potential to be a designer? Excellent, excellent question. So new technology, um, transforming design. Very good. Next up is, uh, folks, let's keep the questions brief so we can go through as many questions as possible, okay? Uh, Rich, uh, followed by Rich, Rojin, Charlie, and David. Rich. Yes, uh, a disclaimer, I haven't read the book yet, so I don't know whether it's addressed, but the two questions I have is, um, given the, how things that we would design are in a more complicated world, how do we deal with disagreements uh, among people on values and priorities? Wonderful. Uh, drive uh, our design and... Um, uh, are there tools or approaches for dealing with unintended consequences? Wonderful. Um, tools for dealing with disagreements of values and unintended consequences. Excellent. Next up is going to be Rojin followed by Charlie. Rojin. Um, in my ex many experiences with design, different degrees of scale and um, different degrees of development. Um, what I really wanted to do was always curtailed by funding and by money and by the time pressures of money. Is this process going to, I don't know, make me less pessimistic about that? Okay, uh, constraints of funding, how do you deal with that? Okay, excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Charlie, uh, followed by Dolores and David. Charlie. Uh, yeah, simple question. Um, I know that holistic thinking uh, occupies a very central place in, 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 in uh, design, uh, the design way. Uh, and I'm interested in um, uh, how would a person learn to do that in a way that would be uh, harmonize with the reasoning and rational part so that they could work together in a, in a harmonious way that, uh, that, you know, you can go to school and learn how to do, how to solve equations and stuff like that. And you can learn all of that, that mechanical type stuff, but, to, but to learn that artistic or holistic sort of thing, um, uh, that doesn't seem to me, I mean, meditation is one way, I guess, but uh, I, I don't see uh, a school for, for uh, holistic thinking uh, anywhere around. Wonderful. Uh, how do you, learn holistic thinking and integrate it with rational thinking. Thank you. Next up is going to be Dolores, David, Judith, Laura, and Donna. Dolores. Can you, un okay, there we go. Sorry. How is the evolution of technology and social media disrupting design thought process? Wonderful. How is evolution of technology and particularly social media disrupting design process? Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be David followed by Judith. David. Right. Um, this is uh, along the lines of Rich's questions, but a little further. And 
I learn the most from looking at contradictions and errors and like learning. So I'm just going to sort of say this bluntly just to make the point about how do we go forward to create direction and action, project to the future, you know, on issues that are of significant value to like with moral value to us, with great value to us. How do we get which way to go when we know that these problems and issues are filled with disputes and conflict now and they're in conflict even with our some of our own values which is got it we yeah we we take values of freedom and equality and a specific example got we it. Be no no I, I, let's, let's just put it as yeah. that right i mean the, the question okay. is um how do you design in the context where there is a fundamental disagreement of values both within us and around us. Uh, excellent. The, the, the idea that not everyone's opinion is equal, but we value equality. Got, How do we got pull you. Pull that got in. It. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, thank you. Next up is going to be Judith, followed by Laura, Donna, Mark, and Kevin. Judith. Uh, my question is kind of in a similar line. I'm, I was thinking about, you know, that we recently watched the ascent of man and Galileo and, um, you know, Steve Jobs and people came up in my mind and it seemed like they were um, solo um, designers more. And it, it feels like now, um, you know, we can all experience in our own small words, ways, ways we design our lives and things we create. But um, for big things, social, environmental, and sustainability issues that we all have a stake in, has design become more of a community endeavor? Wonderful. Um, what is and okay. how how would we engage in in that type of design as individuals? <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, is uh, how does design as a community endeavor work? as opposed to a solo individual or a solo endeavor. Excellent. So, folks, these are fantastic questions. Fantastic questions. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Laura, Donna, Mark, Kevin, Rupali, and Sanjay. Laura. OK, the question what it came up that everybody could become a designer with the new technology. In that case, if everybody can become a designer, how do you begin to evaluate um, all the, you know, the designs? Which one's better? Which one, you know? Wonderful. If so everybody's, yeah. If everybody's a designer, how do you evaluate the quality of uh, design? How do you evaluate, distinguish uh, the quality? Yeah, the value of Next the up, uh, thank you. Next up is going to be uh, Donna. Um, my question is. Has agility led to superficiality? Um, have we swung the pendulum too far? And how do we get back to balance? Wonderful, uh, excellent question. Has agility led to superficiality and how do you retrieve the depth? Next up is going to be, uh, let's see, Mark followed by Kevin, Mark. I guess mine is more self-centered. I uh, have not read the book yet. I, I'm asking, what can I expect the real world results of reading the book and participating in these lectures is going to impact the way I work or interact with others? Wonderful. What can you expect to get out of this book? Yeah. Excellent. Um, all right. Next up is going to be Kevin followed by Mike. Kevin. Thank you, Santa. My question, who do we design for? Who is going to be benefit from it? Who could be harmed from it? Thank Wonderful. You. Who uh, do you design for? Uh, who could be harmed from it? Wonderful. Excellent, excellent question. Thank you, Kevin. Next up is uh, Mike, Rupali, Sanjay, Christian, and Christian. Mike. Okay, uh, uh, several people have asked the questions, how do you handle a community exercise? He said, my question is, um, uh, how do you merge uh, control of a large development like uh, Windows 11 or the Tesla automobile or a, a, a reusable space module where hundreds of people have to be coordinated and, uh, and uh, 
you, you want to work a life cycle cost uh, issue and support issue after it's delivered. Um, and uh, there's a guy named Tom Gilb who uh, tried to answer that question. Okay, uh, I'll keep it as a question. We'll, let's, yeah. let's, let's keep it to questions. So how well, do you handle a large development like, uh, like building, you know, like, like a space program, like running a space program? Next up is going to be uh, Rupali, Sanjay, Christian, uh, and Christian. Rupali. So my question is about the study of sociology and how it affects design, uh, whether that should be part of education when we are talking about design. Wonderful. Um, how is the field of sociology, uh, you know, impact uh, design? So what is the relationship between sociology, sociology and design? Excellent. Thank you. Next up is going to be Sanjay, Christian and Evanik. Sanjay. Uh, thank you. So um, I, um, I mean, I'll make a comment first that, that design really requires a goal. Um, and um, from Maritza's explanation, I understood that in the book, um, uh, you know, Mr. Nelson, he talks about measurement as having uh, elements of interpretation. And, and I would see that as, as, for example, the concept of resolution, when you're taking a measurement, there's a certain resolution, there may be bandwidth. So, you know, designs have, have a goal in mind. So my question is, is while designing a system, um, how would one know when all design goals have been met with sufficient resolution? Wonderful. How do you know? Excellent, excellent question. How do you know uh, design goals have been met with sufficient resolution? See, this is, you, you, you betray the fact that you are a system designer, Asenjay. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Christian, followed by Evany Kencho. Christian. Um, hi. So I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, concerning the book. I haven't read the book yet, but I'm just thinking about how to apply these concepts. So my first question is, how do you use these principles like in a business setting? Because we're in such a globalized society and there's so many different competing needs and um, different clients that a business will interact with. So that's my first question. And mm -hmm. my second question is, um, because a lot of younger people really want to change government systems, and um, I wanted to know how can governments uh, with diverse populations and um, people who, you know, are not satisfied um, with these governments, like how can they use these principles to serve their population? So, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Great questions. I'm going to combine them as saying, how do how do governments or businesses, these large organizations that have many stakeholders with conflicting goals, how do they use uh, design? Um, thank you. Next up is going to be Evanik followed by Joe. Evanik. Yes, my question is, uh, how do you get people inspired to go along with your design? So you're the design maker, but obviously you're gonna need other people how do you inspire them or get buy-in from them or oh, for them? Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, it's, that's a new angle. Excellent. Uh, how do you inspire uh, people to support uh, champion uh, your design? Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Joe, Joe followed by Jyoti. Sure. Yeah, so one of the things that are, are needed whenever you're doing it, like kind of a systems analysis, you have to set up boundaries. So what are the tools that you use in order to set up boundaries when initially doing an analysis? Wonderful. How do you set boundaries? Um, very good. All right, next up is Jyoti. Will the designs have the potential to distort the reality? Okay, very good. Will designs distort reality? Ah, excellent. Uh, all right, folks, these are just so amazing questions. Okay, so um, let's see how how are we going to do this? Okay, let's let's look at the time. Uh, it's ten fifty four. Okay, firstly, I'm going to recount all the questions. Okay, um, 
the first thing I want to say is that this book is very detailed and we are going to go dive into the book. Most of us have not read the book. Um, so we will go into these questions, you know, in, in part, but I want to just show you the range of questions. See, that is what is great about this book because this concept of design, though it's just one concept, it covers, it's, it's a crucial concept in, in human lives. Um, so let's just, I'm just going to count, uh, first list the questions. So one kind of question, I'm just going to, um, because I'm doing this in real time, um, I'm going to go ahead and look at kind of categories here. So one category that we started, I'm going to do it almost chronologically, and then we'll put it together. So one category is talking about new technology. So what does evolution of technology do to design? Is this um, helpful? To what extent is it helpful? To what extent it is harmful? So design and new technology, uh, that's a very large area. So that's one large area. The second has to do with disagreement of values. Several people brought it up or resolving conflicts of values within an, a large organization that has different stakeholders with different, so that it's a question of you know, conflict of values. So that's, um, that's a second theme that I see. Uh, the next one is that of kind of holistic thinking and rational thinking. Large part of the Western world, uh, you know, Western world is very much on the kind of logical axis and the East is more on the, the intuitive axis. How do you get to be more that way? That was Charlie's question. Um, then, uh, let's see here. A whole bunch of questions were about community design. How do, we, how do we actually design in a group? Okay, so that, is, that was the next one. Uh, next one, I want to talk about kind of agility of design, like the speed of design and the thoroughness or a depth of it. Is there a, is there a trade-off over there? Um, next one is, what do you expect to get from the book? Okay, I think this is a question we absolutely must answer because that is the whole purpose of doing this first meetup, okay? So if we don't do anything else, we have to answer that question. And even if we take more time on that question, I think it'll be well worth it. Don't worry, I'm keeping track of all these questions. I'm going to type them up and I'm going to put it up on the meetup pages. So you'll have, and I'm going to organize them better than what I'm able to do right now on the fly, okay? I wanna give you the range of it. So that question, and that one goes to Mark. Mark, great question. <laughs> Uh, so we, we are going to go start with that question, okay? Um, who do we design for? That's a very fundamental question. Look at like the different aspects of design. Like um, Marshall McLuhan says, audience is the formal cause of speech, of a presentation. So the, th that's a very crucial question. Who, who are you designed for, uh, designing for? Uh, how does it work in a large development? So that's both at the group level, as well as the issue of handling of the conflict conflict level, uh, the intersection between sociology and design. Uh, that's a kind of asking the same question at a higher level. Um, how do we know that design goals have been met with sufficient amount of resolution? How do we know, how do we figure out the boundaries of design? These are all detailed questions about how do you do design, okay? Um, then you got, um, how do you inspire people? to support the design? How do you actually sell the design once you have it? And does, will designs distort the world? Okay, so what we're going to do is that I'm going to focus on the first question. Uh, Shrikan, there's one more question from Ambika in the chat. Uh, question, how can one design life going forward with uncertainty of current environment? That's very, very good question because that's again goes to the heart of the theme of the book of kind of intentional design in face of uh, uncertainty. So excellent question. Uh, so this is, uh, so we'll, we'll put that in as well, but I'm going to start off with the question. What do you expect to get from the book? Uh, now, Mark, you're going to have answers from people who have read the book and you're going to have answers from people who have not read the book and you're going to see why they are planning to read the book. 
Uh, so I'm really, really interested in this. So please go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to answer this question. The question on the table right now is, what do you expect to get from the book? Gene, what do you expect to get from the book? Folks, keep your answers short mm -hmm. so we can go through as many answers as we possibly can. Jean. Yeah, I think what do you learn from how to design? Design not just design apply for every part of your life. You can design your yourself, your future, your environment, your relationship. Everything can be designed. So I think understand design is critical. It's about vision and fulfillment. You have a vision, then how you make it happen? That's design. So I think it's critical for everybody in every part of life. So you will benefit for sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. I know you, you've been living this design principle for a long time, and I really, really appreciate that you're, you're part of this. Uh, next up is Brian, Joe, Sanjay, and Rupali. Brian, what do you expect to get? So I agree with uh, very much of what Jean said in terms of everyone in, all, in different contexts. But uh, I have dealt with questions very similar to this, teaching for 15 years in business school. I don't want to, I won't say that too much, but I think the answer is reading a book like this, and I do agree this design sounds like a very powerful focus, a very powerful tool. It will help you ask the right questions in a professional or business context. And over time, you might, maybe you'll get answers, maybe you won't to your questions. But over time, if this is a powerful tool and you ask the good questions, your credibility will increase within your organization and uh, you'll actually improve the organization. Wonderful, thank you, Brian. Next up is Joe, Sanjay, Rupali, David and Maritza. Joe. Yeah, one of the things uh, listed in the uh, in the short video that was posted for this meetup uh, was the historical context and actually bringing back wisdom as uh, in, in integrating that into design. And I think that would actually, as we, I, we were fortunate enough to have Harold in our breakout room, one of the goals of the book is to change your orientation. So look at something a little bit different than you actually initially did when you started reading the book. And I think it will achieve that either through ultimate particulars or in terms of measurement. Uh, those are the two areas that I would expect myself to make the biggest jump. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Sanjay followed by Rupali. Sanjay. Yeah, um, I uh, so I asked um, Harold Nelson uh, a similar question. He was in, in the breakout room also, and um, I really appreciated his answer. Um, though I I have not read the book yet, but based on his answer, um, I was able to elucidate uh, maybe helping with um, uh, Mark's question or the broad question that several people asked. Um, and and I think that that um, what people can get out of it is that. The world is composed of, of a, a complex combination of things, of parts and holes, um, that there's a, syst a systemic breakdown of that, and that really the world can be understood by any one of us, um, but it does require focus and effort. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Next up is going to be Rupali, David, and Maritza. Rupali. So, um, you know, as an educator, I would like to know how to teach design. Uh, as an architect, I've learned um, how to design and have been implementing that uh, in, as an educator too. Uh, but the children today are going to be the designers of tomorrow. And I'd like to, uh, you know, my hope is that this book will help me teach those concepts to children. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Um, next up is going to be David followed by Maritza. David. Hi, well, I'm, I'm hoping and believing that in discussing this book with other people, as opposed to just working my own reading, but working with other people, uh, I'll be able to grow in the way of discovering questions, answers, approaches. Personally, I'm not thinking in a business context to be able to reach desiderata, the desired things that I want to see currently in society that apparently I do not have the skills to do. I lack either imagination, influence, paradigms, because group action is so mysterious to me. But I think in wrestling with this book on concrete things with a group, 
that'll be an experience for me. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, and I think you, you will add a lot to the group as you always do, thank you. Uh, next up is Maritza. So, um, you know, most of you here have heard me. I'm, I'm almost a little bit of a broken record. I have repetitive concepts that I keep bringing in and tying in. And uh, near and dear to me is the idea of holding the individual tightly and also holding the community tightly. Both need to be elevated in order to, um, for us to move forward and do greater things. And honestly, Mark, in this book, I see that. I see a different way of saying this, the, the admonition for us to banish the either or and to embrace the yes and. And I, I think that's what you, you can get from this book. Another way for us to see that there is a culture that exists that can show us more perspectives and how to bring more things together. Wonderful. Uh, Harold, would you like to answer this question? No? Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, so we've, I think we've, we've done a good job of this question. And what I want to do, what, what I want to tell you that the answers to many of those questions that you asked are in the book. So uh, let's, let's read the book. I'm going to put all the questions in the meetup as well as on the YouTube video. So we can go ahead and go through, um, go through everything. Um, uh, Laura, you wanted to answer, what do you expect to get from the book? Go ahead. Uh, Laura, you're on mute. Okay. I feel Go like ahead. I'm a fully integrated sort of humanities and science person. And I'm curious to see how I will emerge after reading this book because sure. I, I feel a little bit like insulted that they keep wanting to separate people like me. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so what we are going to do next is I think this is a good point. We, we are at 11, uh, we just passed 11 o'clock. This is a good point to end. Um, I invite you, this is going to be a really, really powerful experience. Uh, today was simply an overview to get you excited about seeing the kind of richness of uh, this book. I think the questions more than anything else. I love the presentations, by the way, okay? Thank you, thank you so much. You know, Joe did a fantastic. You know, Joe, Maritza, Jean, Rupali, Charlie, all of them did a fantastic job. But really, that is all. They are all. All of us are just trying to get you to just read the book and work on the book with us together. Because it's not just about reading. Even if you have read the book, I'm telling you that the conversation. And this is clear from what David said. David has been discussing this book with CJA since 2015 or so, probably before that. And uh, he's, but I think the format that we have of so many different people coming at the same issue and the format that allows all of this expression to take place at the same time, interrelation of those things to take place. Um, I think it's a very powerful format. And I think this book um, is a great book to focus on. It is rich enough. It is deep enough uh, to do that. So I am just delighted. So thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to seeing you uh, next Monday. Next Monday, we are going to be looking at the prelude. Okay. Uh, so that's, we're just going to focus on the prelude. And then um, we will go to the, you know, part one. Uh, after that. So you can go ahead and read ahead. It's okay to cheat um, because I'm going to keep, everybody's going to keep on spoiling the book for you because we will keep giving you overviews of everything. So feel free to read as fast as, as far ahead as you want and look forward to seeing you back soon. See you everybody. Bye.